In our previous lecture, I indicated that it was impossible to offer a precise date when modern Jewish history begins, uh, and certainly when modern Jewish intellectual thought begins. Uh, but nevertheless, I want to begin somewhere, and where I'm going to begin is usually not the time frame offered for a course on modern Jewish thought. But nevertheless, it seems to me that there is something to learn from talking about this experience. So I want to talk about Italy, and I want to talk about the period of the ghetto. And I want to define what I mean by that and suggest that in some ways, some of the issues, some of the developments that modern Jewish thinkers will be reflecting upon emerge already in the context of this 16th and 17th century experience. And also in our next lecture, when we speak about the 17th and 18th century directly, we will see further developments that perhaps cannot be defined precisely uh, with the events that will follow, nevertheless suggest indeed a continuity, a framework, a context for understanding challenges and novel situations in which Jews find themselves. Let me begin with the Italian experience, and particularly that remarkable experience of the ghetto. The starting point is around 1492, the period when Italian Jews experience a large immigration of Spanish Jews who are expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. And within the context of various migrations from France, from Germany, and now from Spain, the Italian Jewish community becomes much more complicated. The issue of identity, of defining who Jews are, are really exacerbated by the fact that now we are speaking about not one community of Jews, but a kind of meeting place of, uh, of a central location where Jews are coming from west to the east, from north to the south, from south to the north, and are thereby defining, redefining their Jewish space in a new way. And of course, let us bear in mind that when we speak about the 15th century, we are speaking about a world which is also undergoing radical change. Discovery of a new world, interestingly, at the same point when Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, the 16th century, or the beginning of the 16th century and its later development, is clearly is marked by a period of great instability, of great reflection on the larger issues of what culture means, and also a reflection on the meaning of life in general. In this context, let me insert the Jewish experience. The first ghetto emerges in Venice in the year 1516. The word is, of course, ghetto is laden with negative emotion for the Jewish experience. In our own day, we often use the word quite loosely and inaccurately. There is such a thing as the Warsaw Ghetto, whatever that exactly meant. Black minorities or other minorities often speak about living in the ghetto experience. Uh, clearly, the term uh, suggests any kind of social setting where people are forced, are compelled to live within boundaries, separated from others and are forced, obliged to live within a certain particular space. The situation of Venice in 1516, of course, was quite different. Indeed, the architects of the Jewish ghetto of Venice believed that they were creating a compulsory segregated quarter in which all Jews were required to live and in which no Christian was allowed to live. That was clearly the ideal. But if any of you have seen the ghetto, even in the 21st century, you know it is a space which is indeed not so closed off. The doors were open during the day. Jews could go out. Christians could come in. And also notice that this ghetto was very much in the heart of the urban center of Venice. And therefore, ironically and paradoxically, what emerges already, and I'm now anticipating what I'm going to say in just a few minutes, is the creation of a space which is supposedly closed but is really open and which is to sort of insulate and isolate Jews from Christians, but ironically and paradoxically does the opposite. Because of its, uh, its closeness, its cont contiguity to the larger neighborhoods of Venice, Jews and Christians are interacting more and learning about each other more than they would in where if, you, if you sort of disperse Jews. In other words, concentrate Jews in the center of the urban uh, scene of Venice, and all of a sudden, they are learning a great deal about their Christian neighbors, and vice versa, their Christian neighbors are learning about the Jews. But here I'm jumping ahead of myself. The word ghetto itself probably comes from the word jetare, 
the Italian word for to pour uh, latent, uh, to pour steel, to pour metal, uh, probably coming from the location of a foundry uh, in Venice uh, in the 16th century. Others have defined the term uh, by a Hebrew definition. Uh, ghetto also sounds like the Hebrew word get. Get is the Hebrew word for divorce, as if to suggest a divorce between Jews and Christians. Have it as you like, the ghetto created a new situation for Jews, a sense of enclosure and segregation, in which the Catholic community was supposedly shielding itself from Jewish con uh, contamination. One historian has referred to the ghetto as a kind of urban condom, a condom separating the pollution of the Jew, the dirt of the Jew from uh, the, cleanse, the, 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 the cleanliness, the, the purity of Christian civilization. As you will see, uh, if it is indeed an urban condom, it is a condom you would not want to use for safe sex. You'll forgive me. The period of the ghetto has usually been described as a period of distancing and alienation of the Jewish minority from its Christian neighbors, where Jewish culture became more insulated and cut off culturally and socially. This is, of course, in opposition to a previous period, the period of the Renaissance at the end of the, four, at the, end of the 15th and early 16th century. In, during the Renaissance period, Jews were invited to Renaissance courts. Jews taught uh, Christian uh, humanists. Uh, Jews uh, taught the Kabbalah, the mystical traditions, uh, to Christians. And indeed, what we see, at least as it's painted by historians of the 20th century, a kind of idyllic portrait of a new Jewish-Christian relationship, at least for elites. And then, all of a sudden, the Counter-Reformation, the period of the Catholic offensive against first Protestants and then Jews, the creation of the ghetto, the burning of the Talmud, which is also part of this same period in the middle of the 16th century, the, the, the creation of a, a new offensive in which to stamp out Jewish learning through its great sacred books called the Talmud, and then ultimately the creation of the ghetto, first in Venice, but then spreading throughout all of Europe, or all of Italy in particular, namely uh, uh, throughout the, the, uh, the other cities of Italy, uh, in Rome itself, the famous ghetto of Rome, in Florence, in Mantua, in Padua, etc., etc. This spread so that by the end of the 16th century, the entire Italian peninsula is filled with new ghetti, with new communities of Jews, segregated, cut off from the larger society. Within this new Jewish space, according to this view of historians, what emerges is a new kind of Jewish culture, insulated, hermetically sealed off from the rest of the culture, where Jews turn within themselves to become more involved with things like the Kabbalah, like Jewish mystical activities. In fact, there is a rise of Jewish mysticism in this 16th century, which somehow coincides with the creation of the ghetto. In other words, Jews cannot cope with the outside because they are now closed in. They turn within themselves. Now, the way that I've set this up suggests, indeed, that I don't buy it. I think the situation is more complex and more interesting, and therefore, I want to try to talk about the ghetto experience in a new way. In order to do that, I would like to avail myself of four portraits. These are only mental portraits. I'm, I can't create a movie for you here. But what I want to try to do is to have you conjure up in your own mind four scenes. And I want to use these scenes as kinds of proof texts of the experience I want to speak about. And then I want to return and consider the ghetto and its cultural importance, which is really the purpose of this lecture, from an entirely different perspective. So rather than speak in the abstract now, I want to speak about the ghetto experience, primarily in Venice, but in one case in the city of Modena, from four different vantage points. Have you consider this data, and, there, and, and thus we will analyze it. Scene number one, or proof text number one. In 1638, in the early part of the 17th century, a rabbi of Venice named Simona Luzzato, also known in, by his Hebrew uh, first name, Simcha Luzzato, wrote a work in Italian called in translation, Discourse on the Condition of the Jews in the Fair City of Venice. This was written in Italian, 
This rabbi had written other works in Italian. Very interesting that a rabbi is not writing in Hebrew. He's not writing rabbinic text, but he's writing in Italian. And his audience is not Jews this time. It is written to the Venetian leaders, the doge, and their public, arguing in a very interesting pamphlet why the Jews should not be expelled from Venice and its land territories. Apparently, there had been a threat of expulsion. The Jews had lived in Venice for several uh, centuries. They had created a remarkable uh, international trade. They were important as merchants, as moneylenders, as bankers. They were a vital part of the economy of Venice. And now someone had threatened to kick them out. The rabbi, instead of going to pray or to meditate, decides to pick up a pen and to express himself in eloquent Italian and to write to his contemporaries and to say to them, look, you guys are making a big mistake. This is why the Jews should be left in Venice, because we belong here, because we've contributed to this culture, both economically, socially, and culturally. And therefore, I will write this work. This course offers cogent economic and political arguments why Jews should remain in the city and how they have contributed to the culture of Venice. Indeed, Rabbi Luzzato succeeds in encouraging his, co his fellow Venetians to forget about this expulsion edict, and he succeeds in his work of anti-defamation to convince the public of the utility of the Jews for Venice and the crisis is abated. All right, that's the first scene. Think of a rabbi writing such a political statement using economic and political arguments to defend Jewish rights in Venice in the early part of the 17th century. Scene number two. In 1624, about 14 years, exactly 14 years earlier, a man by the name of Joseph Hamitz graduates from the medical school of Padua. And his teacher, another renowned Venetian rabbi, Leon Modena, makes him a party. Now, a few words of explanation. Padua was the university where Venetian nobles went to school. In other words, it was part of the Veneto, those land, land areas of Venice. Padua was the great university. It was the great university of science and medicine uh, in the 15th and 16th century, and even in the 17th century during its decline. It was one of the great places to be. It was the Harvard or Yale, or I should say Penn, of, uh, of uh, uh, university culture uh, throughout all of, uh, of European civilization. Clearly, Jews attending the university is a novel endeavor. There are rumors of Jews attending universities during the medieval period, uh, for example, in Montpellier in France. But generally, we know that the first Jews to be allowed to attend a nominal Catholic university was in Padua. And therefore, what emerges at the end of the 16th century are hundreds of Jewish kids entering the university. Now, where do you go to school in a, in a Catholic university? You have a, a department of theology. You have a department of law. Both of them are, are colored with Christian theology. Uh, you, law means canon law. The only neutral place you can study is medicine. And therefore, you enter the medical faculty. What emerges from the 16th century on are several hundred graduates of the university, and later on other Italian universities, and later on other European uh, universities, uh, graduating in medicine. The emergence of a kind of collective body of Jewish students who are engaged in secular education through the study of medicine. Hamitz was one of them. Modena, his teacher, published a pamphlet of Hebrew poems written by many Jewish cultural leaders and Paduan graduates. Remarkable achievement. Very interesting also that they should um, celebrate this young man graduating from the university by writing Hebrew poems. I'm not saying they were good Hebrew poems, but they were, they were poems uh, written by doctors, by, for, by former graduates of Padua and so on, celebrating this great moment. The event thereby symbolized the larger reality of talented Jewish students attending this Catholic university, entering the medical field. And through their education, which included both the humanities and the science, this was a humanistic education, Latin and Latin texts, uh, along with the medical and the scientific text, coming out and serving as doctors throughout Italy and throughout all of Europe. 
In other words, this particular intellectual elite, which is shaped by the university, is clearly a new thing. Hametz is a very interesting study because ultimately he finds, he becomes infatuated with the Kabbalah, with Jewish mysticism, and even becomes infatuated with the messianic figure we will talk about in the next lecture, named Shabtai Tzvi, and goes off the deep end, and Leon Amodin is so upset that he has lost this talented, rational student of the sciences. But nevertheless, what is important to capture at this moment is the notion of a celebration of a Jewish student at the university. This, too, is a ghetto scene. So that's scene number two. First scene, you recall, the scene of Lutzato writing his political pamphlet. The second scene, the celebration of a graduation from the University of Padua. Scene number three, the same Leon Modena, a very colorful Venetian rabbi of the 17th century who leaves us a very interesting autobiography, recruits his talented friend, Salomone de Rossi, to compose music for the synagogue of Venice, using Hebrew texts, but introducing for the first time polyphony, choral music. In other words, let's lighten up this dry affair. Let's get this guy who writes music for the court of Mantua and the court of Venice. Let's hire him, bring in a group of, uh, of soloists, and let us perform music that is similar to the Baroque church. Indeed, there is a little bit of, uh, of uh, criticism of this approach, and Modena is forced to write an accompanying rabbinic responsum, justifying the novelty and arguing that indeed it is kosher, it is, it is okay to do it, it is fine to do this. Uh, De Rossi composes his great songs, which have been recorded up until the 21st century, introducing choral music into the synagogue, and transforming the cultural habits of Jews to make them more in line with Catholic society. What emerges quite interestingly is if you've ever listened to this music, and I'm sorry I can't sing you right now, is the fact that the Hebrew words make it Jewish, but the music itself is clearly Baroque, and clearly you could hear the same kind of music more or less in the Catholic Church. This is what I meant by the ghetto being a place that seemingly is distancing you from the Christian society, but in a real way is making you feel much closer because you are hearing, aesthetically, you are reacting in the same way that your Christian uh, um, uh, Italians are reacting to their own church service in a similar way you do it for your synagogue. So scene number three, therefore, is the emergence of choral music in the synagogue in the 17th century. Finally, scene number four. At the end of the 16th century, a rabbi who was also a Kabbalist, that, that is, an uh, expert on Jewish mystical tradition, by the name of Aaron Brachia of Modena, a community of Jews not too far away from Venice, decided to curb a good time. There had been a tremendous Jewish festival, a very Italian Jewish festival. On the night before a young man was initiated into the covenant of Abraham by being circumcised, what we call in Hebrew a brit milah, to have his brit, the people got together and had a party, a big party, men and women, wine, you know, vino, this was still Italy, uh, enjoying themselves, uh, laughing it up, enjoying each other's company, going on all through the night, getting plastered with wine, and then hopefully the one who was to circumcise the kid was not too drunk, and in the morning he would do the ritual act and everything would be, uh, would be fine. The rabbi heard about this. This had been going on for years after years after years and said, no way. We have to stop this. Essentially, men and women need to be separated. Essentially, the members of the religious confraternity, called in Hebrew the Chevra, will take over the study of mystical texts and pray throughout the entire night to make it a very serious and somber experience and thus toning down this popular celebration is the way to go by sacralizing it. Now what does this remind you of? It should remind you of essentially a Catholic Church during the period of the counter-reform, during the, 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 the counter-reformation of the Catholic Church also entering into the secular pockets of Italian society and transforming them by sacralizing them, by making them more religious. 
In other words, a religious authority on the top trying to impose its will on ordinary parishioners. Indeed, that rabbi is functioning in a very similar way to his own Catholic uh, counterparts. So that story, that last scene, may seem sort of out of uh, whack with the other three scenes, but I'm going to suggest here by using these scenes a larger picture that will emerge. I threw out the word before paradoxically, ironically paradoxically, I want to come back to the word paradox. Paradox may be a difficult word for an historian to use because it sort of suggests that he doesn't understand fully what he's talking about. We have a paradoxical situation here. But in this respect, paradox is the right word to use in describing what we think is going to be but what actually emerges. No doubt, the ghetto was congested and dirty and humiliating and miserable. I'm not suggesting here that ghettos are great. And certainly the ghetto of Venice and the ghettos that followed in the 16th and 17th century. Indeed, when you look at the Venetian ghetto today, the whole square has been cleared. There's a lot of space. There's a big courtyard and so on. In the 16th and 17th century, it was filled with very high buildings. And everything was closed, and it was dirty, and it was smelly, and there were poor people, and there were beggars, and so on. It wasn't such an idyllic place. On the other hand, there is something to be good to, to be said about this ghetto experience. What is the opposite of ghetto when one speaks about the ghetto experience in the 16th century? You must recall that by 1492 and 1497, Jews had been expelled from over most of all, over all of Western Europe. In England in 1290, in France in 1306, in France again in 1384, uh, in Spain in 1492, in, in Portugal in 1497, in 1569 from the Papal States. In other words, the rule of order, the rule uh, that we know, the, the, the norm, so to speak, was indeed to kick out the Jews, to forcefully remove them and to force them to find a new home elsewhere. What does ghetto do? It may be small, it may be dirty, it may be confining but it is a sense of entitlement. It is saying, the Christians are saying, this is your Jewish space. This is your space within the geography of Christian space. This is your area. You are entitled to live here. Ghetto legitimizes Jewish existence. In other words, the sense of entitlement must be balanced against the notion of expulsion. By offering Jews a place within Christian society, it offered the Jews a new sense of intimacy with Christians, a new sense of belonging and identifying with the outside culture, because the ghetto was indeed right next to, contiguous with Christian space. And thus what emerges is a twofold thing. On the one hand, the possibility for a Jew to feel that he or she belongs, that he or she is part of Christian society, on the one hand, on the other hand, a sense of closeness and intimacy with the, out the larger world, which although meant to protect and separate, indeed, uh, using that image of the condom again, the bad condom, that is, what emerges is indeed a kind of porous boundaries where Jews and Christians go back and forth and learn about each other from close up. Uh, now, what emerges in this society? Let's take a look at some of the products of this remarkable culture. In the 16th century, Jewish culture is transformed, like Christian culture, by print, by the publication of books. The first great printing presses are in Italy, and the greatest printing press of all is in Venice during the period of the ghetto. Indeed, the printing industry is taken over by Christians, working in collaboration with Jews, the printing industry of publishing Hebrew books I'm referring to. So what emerges remarkably, even during a period of censorship and burning of books and all kinds of activities that are clearly hurting uh, the Jewish book trade, is the emergence of some kind of collaboration between Jews and Christians and the explosion of the Hebrew word in print. Clearly that is a product of the ghetto culture. The other aspect we've already mentioned, the university and its great uh, opportunities that are now available for the first time to Jews as well as to Christians. Clearly, a university-trained Jewish doctor has a kind of approach to the world, to his interaction with Jews and Christians, that someone who had not had that experience does not have. Clearly, by creating a group of intellectual elites who are emerging from the university, who are participating in the forum of great learning going on in the university, 
something has been also transformed in Jewish culture and in terms of Jewish-Christian interaction. In the culture of the ghetto, well-to-do Jews become richer, they become more culturally creative, the emergence of Jewish music we have seen, the conspicuous synagogue art, uh, Baroque poetry, marriage certificates, sumptuous wedding feasts. In other words, as in any urban setting, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So clearly we hear at the same time about Jews who have not enough to eat, who are struggling, who are assimilating, who are losing their Hebrew literacy. At the same time, we hear about rich who are creating all kinds of synagogue art on the one hand, and, and, and Hebrew literature and Hebrew works of great intensity uh, on the other hand. So that clearly the contradictions, the paradoxical relationships that we are describing make this ghetto experience much more complicated to define. And within the context of all of this emerges the Kabbalah, the Jewish traditions of mysticism, embraced by Jews, but then embraced by Christians as well during the Renaissance. The great figure of uh, Renaissance culture who loves the Kabbalah, who studies the Kabbalah, who argues that you need to know the Kabbalah in order to be a good Christian, is the great humanist of Florence, Pico della Mirandola. But not only Pico, a whole group of other Christians begin to study the Kabbalah. What emerges in the ghetto is the Kabbalah conquers the sermon. The sermons given by Jewish rabbis in Italian were attended not only by Jews but by Christians. Christians were interested in the Jewish word just as Jews were interested in the Christian word. A kind of cross-fertilization, a kind of cross-cultural dialogue that emerges despite the original intentions of the architects of the ghetto as a whole. Now let us look back very, very quickly then at our four scenes and see if we can bring this all together in our last few moments. I would argue that in the first case, Rabbi Lutzato is arguing in favor of Jewish residency because he feels pretty good about who he is. He feels a sense of entitlement. He feels a sense of belonging. Only in this context of feeling that I belong here could a Jew have the audacity, or should we use the Hebrew word chutzpah, to write an essay of this nature. This is clearly a product of a modern Jewish consciousness. Jews in the Middle Ages were reluctant to express themselves in public in such a way. The second example of the university we have described, a new interaction between Jews and Christians, a new intellectual elite, a new group of Jewish doctors who continue to play uh, in the 17th and 18th century a major role between Jews and Christians linking the two societies, mediators between high and low culture, mediators between Jewish and Christian cultures. And the third example, the example of Jewish music. Music becomes the common denominator between Jews and Christians. The only thing that differentiates the music is the Hebrew words. But the music, the aesthetic tastes, have become similar. Just as in the area of art and architecture, Jews take on um, the larger aesthetic tastes of their Christian contemporaries. And finally, even in the last example of ruining the good time, of stopping the parting, Jews were functioning as their Christian counterparts were functioning in trying to clean up, in trying to sacralize, in trying to make more religious sometime against, uh, quite often against the grain, um, a Jewish community that were going along in their own, their secular practices. What I would argue then is that the ghetto helps to restructure a new urban experience for Jews, stimulated by a new cultural energy among elites and a new closeness, a new sense of allegiance, a new sense of identification with the Christian world. In Italy in this period, we hear for the first time Jews identifying with Catholicism, trying to show the proximity between the two cultures, seeing themselves not only as Jews, but also as Venetians or as Florentines or as Romans. In other words, there is a sense of identity that emerges within this new structure. The ghetto experience, therefore, needs to be rethought regarding its impact upon Jewish culture and also as an interesting prefiguration, adumbration of the close cultural interactions the modern urban experience would hold for Jews in the centuries that follow. Perhaps ironically, it is interesting that I begin this venture, this experience of modern Judaism by speaking about the 16th century. But in many ways, this new restructuring, this attempted closure, which is really an open ghetto, a, a, an interaction between Jews and Christians, 
anticipates in many respects what we will see later on. And we will also see that there is one other element that we have left out. And that is the element of conversos, of the Inquisition, of the messianic experience of the 17th and 18th century. But that is our subject of the next lecture. Lecture 4, 17th Century Marinism and Messianism. In our last lecture, we spoke about the 16th century and the impact of the ghetto on the culture of the Jews and the intellectual life of the Jews uh, in, the, in that century. There are two further themes that I want to develop in this lecture that take us into the 17th century as a center of Jewish cultural transformation and change. The first has to do with the emergence of a new phenomenon in Jewish life called the converso, and the second, the emergence of a messianic movement with large ramifications for Jewish life as well, called Sabbatianism or the messiahship of Shabtai Tzvi. And in a remarkable way, these two forces, these two developments, in fact, are to be linked. And my hope is not only to talk about each individually and to present them as two separate narratives, but then to somehow show that they reflect a larger world of the 17th century. And that world, of course, will help us to explain the subject of our next lecture, which is Benedict Spinoza. Let me begin with a converso phenomenon. What I'm speaking about is, begins actually in 1391. So what I'm going to do is try to cross uh, several uh, hundred years of Jewish Christian history to allow us to focus on the 17th century and understand particularly why this phenomenon is important for Jewish cultural life. In 1391, in Castile and Aragon in Spain, a series of pogroms break out. Many Jews are killed, many are persecuted. What is interesting is not so much that a pogrom, an attack on Jews, had taken place, but what was interesting was the response on the part of large members, large numbers of the Jewish community. They simply gave up their Jewish identities and converted to Christianity. There had always been cases in the medieval past of an individual Jew converting to Christianity. There were individual Christians who converted to Judaism. But never have we seen in the history of Judaism so many large numbers deciding to simply give up the ship, to abdicate their Jewish identity, to essentially enter into a Christian world and to become uh, Christians in a full sense. Their numbers continued to swell during the end of the 15th century and early, and early uh, the end of the 14th century and the early 15th century. In 1412, in the city of Tortosa, a major public trial or a disputation is held by a group of former Jews, Christian apostates, against the Jewish leadership to try to encourage them to approach the baptismal font. The pressure of conversion is great. During a period of two years, this trial goes on, and indeed, it leaves a, a horrible impact upon the larger community of Jews living in Spain. By the second decade and the third decade of the 15th century, more Jews left the Jewish fold and converted to Christianity. By the middle of the 15th century, we can estimate that at least one-third of a population numbering, let's say, 150,000, 250,000, it's very hard to give precise figures, but a large number of Jews, one-third of them had left the Jewish fold. These were the conversos. A more negative term to describe them is the term Murano. Murano means swine in Spanish. It implies, obviously, a very negative association of Jews with pigs. It also is a derogatory term. The more neutral term would be neophyte, convert, or converso. The question which historians have debated for some time now is, why did these people convert? What was their motivation? And indeed, when they converted, were they sincere Christians or were they crypto-Jews, that is, Jews who were practicing Judaism in secret? 
The debate involves several historians, and I won't enter into the names of these historians. What is clear is that by the middle of the 15th century, and particularly by 1481, when the Inquisition is established by Thomas Torquemada, a church institution for driving out heresy within the church, its primary focus are, is the Moranos, or the Conversos, and later on the Moriscos, that is uh, Muslims who converted, who were forced to convert to Christianity. The Inquisition saw as its purpose the notion of inquiring who these people were, whether they were sincere or not, and punishing them if they had been insincere. What emerges is therefore very interesting. On the one hand, an old Christian society, a Jewish society in its midst, and the middle of these two societies, a group of neophytes of recent converts who were neither there or within the Jewish fold or within the Christian fold. The Christian community was not fully ready to embrace these Christians, even though they had converted. In fact, as we will see very shortly, some of these individuals were hated not only because they had been former Jews, but because they were considered to be Jews by race. I had mentioned that the origins of racial anti-Semitism in, in one of my earlier lectures comes from Spain. Here's the particular a setting for this particular phenomenon. That is, a group of new Christians, of conversos, of Muranos, who see themselves trying to be part of Christian society, who are accused of backsliding and being insincere Christians. Were they insincere? A group of historians maintain that they were. Another group argues that they were fully Christianized. Whatever the purpose of the Inquisition, whether it was designed to root out religious heresy, or whether it had other economic and political motives, what is clear is that these groups, the, this group emerged as a very anomalous group, not fitting into Christian society on the one hand or Jewish society on the other. Some of them maintaining their ties to the Jewish community and some of them having been removed altogether. But in the background of all of this is a growing hatred not only for the Jew in Christian society in Spain, but also in particular of uh, uh, a hatred of the Murano, of the Converso. Now what happens, of course, is that the Jews are finally expelled in the year 1492. And as a result, as the Inquisition and as those of the monarchy of Spain proclaim, to remove that lifeline of the Jewish community, these Conversos will then fully integrate and fully enter Christian society. And more or less, that's what happens after 1492. The Inquisition turns to dealing with other heretics, and the number of Murano heretics continues to decline. But our story is not over. Most of the Jews now, who were expelled from Spain in 1492, end up in Portugal. It is the nearest place to go, same climate, same environment, uh, same area in which to live in. And they enter Portugal, and there they create a new situation for the King of Portugal. Five years later, in the year 1497, the king of Portugal proclaims, either get out of Portugal or you will be converted forcefully to Christianity. And therefore, there is another expulsion from Portugal. At the same time, large numbers of Jews now remain in Portugal, having been converted in one day and obviously not being sincere about this conversion. The conversion problem declines in Spain, but it rises in Portugal. By 1536, an inquisition is established in the city of Lisbon, and therefore we see again the same cycle of hatred, animosity, attack on the converso, and an entirely new situation in Portugal. Now one more date, and we are almost ready to talk about the 17th century, which is really the goal of this lecture. In 1580, Spain and Portugal become one. Those conversos who had been treated poorly in Portugal now migrate back into Spain. The element that we must also introduce in this description, of course, is this hatred by blood, this racial anti-Semitism. The word in Spanish is called limpieza de sangre, the purity of blood. All of a sudden we see that racial factors begin to play a role at the end of the 16th century. So these Conversos, there are no longer any Jews there. These people who were former Jews, who had converted over centuries, were still accused of Jewishness, of Jewish backsliding, 
and were accused because of their race of still being Jewish. By the end of the 16th century, the Jews, you recall, had been expelled in 1492. But by the end of the 16th century, a second expulsion, so to speak, emerges. This time, not over one year or one day, but over a period of a gradual emigration of these conversos outside of Spain and Portugal, trying to find places of domicile where they will be treated freely and openly and be able to observe their own faith and to uh, their own uh, lifestyle. Where do they go? Some of them go in the, at the end of the 16th and 17th century to Italy. The cities of Livorno, that is Leghorn and Pisa, become major mercantile centers for accepting these conversos and putting them to work in all kinds of international trade. They go to southern France where they maintain a more or less clandestine existence. But the places that really accept them and where, um, where now in these societies new Jewish communities emerge are number one Amsterdam in the Netherlands and number two Hamburg in Germany. Ports, port cities open for uh, merchandising for uh, people with economic acumen uh, who are clearly interested also since the Netherlands is at war with the Iberian with Spain in, in inviting its emigres to come and settle there. So a massive brain drain, a massive um, emigration of these individuals outside of the Iberian Peninsula and the creation of new communities now of individuals who had lived as Christians and now have the opportunity, at least in Amsterdam and in Hamburg, of returning to their ancestral birthright, of returning to their own Jewish identity. In other words, what I'm trying to suggest is the creation of a traditional Jewish community in Amsterdam beginning at the end of the 16th and 17th century, but a community that is traditional but is also very new and unique in the history of Judaism and the history of Jewish-Christian relations. For the first time, a large number of individuals who had lived as Christians, who had been educated in Latin, Spanish, and Portuguese, now returning to Amsterdam, claiming to relink their lives with the synagogue, with the rabbinate, and to return to the Jewish fold. What emerges on the part of some of these individuals is a new zealotry, a new commitment to Jewish faith. They had lived as Catholics, and now, for the first time, they can express their own individuality by returning to the Jewish fold as adults, learning Hebrew, learning rabbinic texts, entering the synagogue, taking on the responsibility of the mitzvot, of the commandments of Judaism. At the same time, there were others who could not care less, who simply found themselves agnostic, uninterested, interested more in the economic opportunities that... Uh, Dutch Amsterdam offered rather than the religious or, or cultural opportunities. Clearly for these individuals, whether they were convinced Catholics or opportunists or open to any religious experience or indifferent to all of them, clearly there were a wide variety of these individuals. But ironically, what is interesting is that they saw themselves as part as one nation. The same racial categorizing that had gone on on the part of their oppressors, calling them Jews by race, seemed to define them. They could be secular, they could be unconnected to Jewish affairs, to Jewish ritual and Jewish belief, but nevertheless, they were members of the Nazion. Nazion in the sense of not Jews in general, but this particular Jewish ancestry, a Sephardic Jewish ancestry, a converso Jewish ancestry that had originated in Spain, as we saw from 1391 on. This is a remarkable Jewish community in Amsterdam, a community of great cultural significance. Many of them were doctors. Many of them were deeply committed to the study of Spanish and Portuguese literature. Many of them who had dual loyalty, so to speak. On the one hand, they wanted to be Jewish. On the other hand, they also wanted to be Dutch. And on the other hand, they wanted to preserve the legacy of their Spanish and Portuguese roots. Here was an adult population of so-called choosing Jews, choosing to be Jewish at their adult age, learning the ritual, learning the Hebrew, and so on, and trying somehow to integrate within a Jewish community, which by its very nature was very secular, was very open to all kinds of opportunities and lifestyles. 
Indeed, as we will see, Amsterdam in the 17th century is a community where virtually church and state have at least begun to define themselves apart from each other. Amsterdam is a haven from persecution. The Huguenots come to Amsterdam as well. And therefore, within this society of beleaguered minorities, it was permissible, it was possible for Jews to practice their religion in their own ways. This is clearly a novel situation from what had existed uh, prior to this in other societies. And even if we compare this with the ghetto of uh, Italy, we are talking about a novel situation. Jews live in a Jewish quarter, but in Amsterdam, they can live wherever they want. And if any of you have seen the remarkable portraits of Jews by Rembrandt and others, Rembrandt himself lived very close to the Jewish quarter. We can see the kind of interaction between Jews and Christians that went on on a daily basis. I want to mention two other aspects of this culture before turning to my second theme, which is the theme of Messianism and Shabtai Tzvi. Within this culture, several of them became involved in a kind of utopian Messianism. As you will see, many of these conversos brought with them a kind of Christian cultural intellectual baggage. As a result, for them, the notion of a messianic figure, a figure who is both human and divine, a kind of Jesus-like figure, was possible to focus, to think about in the context of a messianic man named Shabtai Tzvi. In other words, what I'm saying is that it is quite interesting, and I'll come back to this point, that the conversos themselves, at least some of them, were attracted to the messianic movement which dominated the 17th century within larger Jewish culture. The second point I want to make, and I will develop this point also in a later lecture, is that for at least a minority of these conversos, the rite de passage, that movement from one world to the next, the rites of passage, could not be an easy one. And for those who imagine that by being a Jew, as opposed to being a Catholic, I would rid myself of all of these uh, crazy notions, of all of these orthodox attitudes, of, of all of these, uh, of, of these ideas that had no value whatsoever, they discovered, that is, a certain conversos, that rabbinic Judaism was just as complex, was just as dogmatic, was just as close-minded as Orthodox Catholicism was as well. And therefore, for at least several members of this community, the transition, the rite of passage, was a difficult one. I want to mention three individuals in this respect who became heretical, who became opposed to rabbinic Judaism and were thrown out of that community. One is a man named Juan de Prado, Another is Oriol de Costa. Oriol de Costa eventually committed suicide because of the extraordinary challenges. He could simply not face the reality of what Judaism meant and what he imagined it to be. And of course, the third person in this group is himself, Benedict Spinoza. And we will talk about his background and his particular importance to Jewish thought uh, in our next lecture. So clearly, therefore, the converso phenomenon of the 17th century the creation of converso communities in Amsterdam and Hamburg, in Italy and elsewhere, clearly changes a picture. It brings Jews and Christians together. It creates a new mentality. It creates a new way of thinking about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, particularly because of the interesting history and legacy of this converso group. Now, my second theme is as interesting and as bizarre as the first. And the point is that they do connect. Here I'm speaking about a phenomenon of a Messiah who declares himself born in Turkey, declaring himself the Messiah in Palestine in the year 1665-66, and then after being caught by Turkish authorities, by Ottoman authorities, decides, decides to convert to Islam. And we all know that if you're going to be a Jewish Messiah, it's not a great idea to convert to Islam or to any other religion for that matter. We would assume by this point that this Messiah story is over. Just a deranged individual who decides to do a strange thing and converts to Islam. But what is interesting is that the Messiahship of Shabtai Tzvi is not over. And that at least among the radical members of his society, they saw in his conversion a secret. A secret that would bring about ultimately the Messianic end. 
The historian of the Kabbalah we mentioned before, Gershon Sholom, has written a great deal about this figure, Shabtai Tzvi, and about his movement called Sabbatianism. He argues that essentially the ideas of Shabtai Tzvi, or the rationalization of his conversion to Islam, came from a set of ideas that had been previously in the air, coming out of a community of Jews who had lived in Palestine, particularly in Safed, surrounding the figure of Isaac Luria, a Kabbalist of the 16th century. I won't try to explain how these ideas have made their mark on Shabtai Tzvi. But what I want to offer is a larger canvas in which to understand Shabtai Tzvi. First of all, the story of Shabtai Tzvi. He converts to Islam. A group of his followers, his more radical followers, see this as an example. A group called the Donmeh convert to Islam as well. And throughout the 17th and the 18th and even into the 19th century, we have remnants of Jewish families who convert to Islam. In the 18th century, another figure by the name of Jacob Frank, a very strange, bizarre fellow, goes down and studies with this group, returns, he had been born in Poland, returns to Poland, and then decides that he will convert to Christianity. And with a thousand of his followers in Warsaw, they are not only convert, but they are sent to the Inquisition because they are clearly a heresy either to Judaism or to Christianity. Frank is a nihilist, argues like the Donmer that in order to bring about the messianic end, we can no longer observe Jewish law. We must break the, the, uh, the stranglehold of the rabbis. And therefore, what emerges within these two extreme factions of this messianic movement is a total break with the norms of traditional Jewish society. This is why Gershon Sholem, as we said, had triggered, had, had seen this particular moment as the trigger for the creation of a modern Jewish consciousness. That is, a rebellion against Jewish norms, against Jewish tradition. Whatever the case may be, these group of Frankists, as they became known, or the Donmeh in Turkey, created havoc. They created a kind of fear and anxiety among a rabbinic establishment in the 18th century. And by the 18th century, it wasn't even clear whether you were a follower of Shabtai Tzvi or not. If you were called a Sabbatean, if you were called a member of this hated sect, you were essentially a deviant. You were essentially an individual who was a dissenter from the tradition. I would like to use the word to describe this group, a word that is used within Christian culture of the time, as enthusiast. That is, a person who believes that his own understanding of God, of faith, his belief system, takes precedence over any other collective tradition. That I, given my own revelatory experience, can decide what I believe in and can preach that teaching to my following. And therefore, I have a right to follow me and my, myself and my own teachings in my own way without anyone interceding and telling me what to believe in. Enthusiasts undermine any traditional collective experience, whether it be Christianity or Judaism. By the 18th century, the word Shabtai or Sabbatean, Shabtai is the Hebrew for Sabbatean, implies not only a follower of Shabtai Tzvi, but a person who has broken with Jewish law who argues that in his own name he knows the truth and he has a right to decide that truth. What is interesting is that already in the time of Shabtai Tzvi, we have a group of conversos, a group of former Christians who had returned to Judaism, finding a home in this bizarre messianic movement. The most famous and Abraham Cardoza, who lives uh, throughout most of the 17th century into the early part of the 18th century, a converso theoretician who adopts the language of Shabtai Tzvi, the language of Shabtai Tzvi of being a forced one. He makes Shabtai Tzvi into a kind of converso himself. He imprints upon the personality of Shabtai Tzvi a kind of converso mentality. We know what the secret is. We preserve it within ourselves. On the outside, we can be Christian, we can be anything. But on the inside, we have the secret truth. Similarly, the followers of Shabtai Tzvi can preserve the norms of Jewish tradition, can break with the norms, but the secret is only within our own hearts, within our own souls. In other words, it was possible to link up ideologically and psychologically a connection between a converso and his own existential return to the Jewish faith 
with this new messianic framework, with this new messianic movement of dissonance and dissent from the Jewish tradition. In the 18th century, public recriminations appear constantly on the part of rabbis condemning the Sabbateans, condemning those enthusiasts, those radicals who cannot accept Jewish authority, who are a liability to the rabbinate and to the Jewish fold. And clearly what emerges then is a remarkable attack on the part, these become the bete noir, they become the enemy par excellence. These are the individuals who are somehow undermining what had been the traditional values of the Jewish faith. Now we are left finally to put these two strands together. On the one hand, the converso experience of the 17th century with all of its dimensions lasting for centuries, inquisitions, not only in Spain and Portugal, later on in Venice, in the New World, in Brazil, uh, uh, in, in Mexico, and, and, and so on. Uh, this is a long story which goes on for several centuries. And also the Sabbatean story, which is also a story which takes us from Shabtai Tzvi in 1665 right through the 17th, 18th, and even into the 19th century. How shall we connect this story? On the one hand, the most obvious way, which Gershon Scholem himself recognized, is to talk about the personal connection between conversos who found the experience of Shabtai Tzvi a meaningful framework for them to express their own Jewish identity. Here was the possibility of looking at a Messiah who had converted, just as they had converted and now had reverted back to their own Jewish identity. It was, of course, a little bit convoluted, but nevertheless, it expressed to them the kind of tensions, the drama. It, uh, they understood themselves. They could impose their own identity and their own set of concerns on this Messiahship. That is why in Amsterdam there were a large group of followers of Shabtai Tzvi, and in Hamburg and throughout the diaspora. In fact, in Smyrna itself, Smyrna it was the birthplace of Shabtai Tzvi in Turkey, in the Ottoman Empire. There were a large group of converso businessmen who had settled as well in the Ottoman Empire. So there was a direct link from the birth uh, of, of Shabtai Tzvi with this converso community. So one connection is obvious, the fact that many conversos entered the Sabbatean ranks, promoted Sabbateanism, understood Sabbateanism in their own terms, and became followers of a messianic movement which, for them, was attractive and somehow inspired them in their own return to the Jewish fold. But I want to argue for something even deeper in terms of a link. I want to suggest that there is a coincidence between Shabtai Tzvi, 1665-66, and 1670, which I'm going to talk about in our next lecture, the date of the publication of Benedict Spinoza's famous work, The Theological Political Treatise. How are we to connect Shabtai Tzvi and Spinoza? My argument is the following. Both are enthusiasts. Both are arguing and trying to attack and to essentially destroy and dismantle the Jewish tradition. Shabtai Tzvi bringing a messianic ideology challenging the rabbis and Spinoza, as we will see, who will take the Jewish tradition and subject it to a rational critique and undermine its viability and, its, and will essentially undermine the particularity of Jewish identity altogether. They are both enthusiasts. One does it through an irrational means, the other does it through a rational means. But both of them are involved in the concerns of Jewish life. Both of them, from the fringe, are attacking the Jewish center and the Jewish rabbinate and Jewish authority, and thus trying to undermine it. If one understands the 17th, 18th century as a period of crisis, as a period of a crisis against authority, political, cultural, social, religious authority, if one links this Jewish phenomenon to a larger world uh, of European civilization as a whole, and understand Spinoza is not only being a Jewish figure within a Jewish intellectual history course, but also as part and parcel of a larger radical critique of religion in general, then one, then one understands the intersection of Jewish history with general European cultural history. We are not speaking about a phenomenon which is marginal either to the Jewish experience or to the Western European experience as a whole. 
we are speaking about something which is remarkably central and remarkably of concern for anyone who studies the history of the Western mind, not only the history of the Jewish mind. So here we have it. Converzos and Sabbateans together were, in fact, for some historians, and we can now understand why, the first modern Jews in challenging the rabbis, in challenging the authority of Jewish law, and in trying to create a new version of Jewish identity and practice in the 17th century. The dual interlocking phenomenon of Moranism on the one hand, or Conversoism on the, on the one hand, and Sabbatianism on the other, is significant in blurring the boundaries between Judaism and other faiths. Notice we are speaking about Jewish, Christian, Christian, Jewish, one passing from one to the other, and at the same time, facilitating the merger of Jewish ideas with radical religious and political movements in Islam and Christianity well into the 19th century. And of course, we have now laid the, grain work, the, the, the groundwork precisely for understanding the origin of the greatest philosopher of the 17th century, and that philosopher is Benedict or Baruch Spinoza.